stop talking. We're just going to stand here awkwardly. <laughs> stand here awkwardly. Where are your folks? That's right. And you all got here. Good job. Good morning and welcome. I have one major announcement and then one or two smaller ones. The major and the most important one of today is this. He's risen. He's risen Amen. I'm glad you understand that. And then a couple of minor things, and we're going to jump right into worship in just a second here. But uh, just so you know, uh, ladies, please note the luncheon coming up and... Get signed up if you are able and planning to go to that and invite whoever you will. Um, I know the WMF would love to get that in order as soon as possible. And then also, uh, LaVon Cornelius is asking that if you are go planning to be in her Philippians Bible study, the worksheets for Lesson 1 are on the information table. Please pick one up today if you think of it when you go out. Any other announcements? If not... Let's open with a prayer, and I'm just going to open with some words, and I, I, I can tell you what happened, and you said he's risen, you told me what happened, but I'm going to let you hear from his own mouth, the one of whom we're talking, and he says in Revelation 1.8, verse 18, he said, I died, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Let's worship him. Let's sing Christ the Lord is risen today.
Now we're going to sing a song. It's called Red Letters. So if you don't know it that well, that's okay. Join along. If not, um, just read the words. Um, and you guys know the red letters are, are Christ's words in the Bible. And this is about the power of them. And I need to cable three. perhaps be wondering, and I hope this is not the case in any of your lives, but if you're thinking, from what am I free? What is it that binds us? What is it that keeps us in bondage? It's our sin. And to be set free from that is the greatest freedom any human can ever know. And in Jesus, we are free. Let's confess, if you would join me. Risen Lord, we have seen the empty tomb, and yet sometimes we act as if we've seen nothing, and we continue to live in fear. Why must we be afraid of death, even after it has been defeated? 
This is a glorious day of gladness and song. Forgive us when we are quick to forget its good news. Help us to be a people of resurrection, not just on this day, but every day. Fill our hearts with your resurrection promise of life and help us to turn from sin and be renewed. Take away the fear of sin's power that we would be glad to tell the story that Christ is risen. In the name of your risen Son, Jesus the Christ, amen. Psalm 34 says, The Lord has answered us and he has delivered us from all of our fears. For those of you who are guests with us this morning, first of all, I should have welcomed you specially, so we're glad you're here. And our tradition here at Redeemer is at this time, uh, every week, we take a few minutes and we pray for the concerns that are present in our body, in our loved ones, or the, the concerns we have uh, in our hearts. And usually I get a, a start of a list before this time comes, and I've got a short list. Uh, but then I'll, I'll open it up to your requests. Uh, first of all, a, a praise, because we've been praying the last two, three weeks that God would move up a date for Dwight Scott. And he did. So his surgery is scheduled for the 8th, a week from tomorrow, rather than three weeks later. So we're thanking God for that and praying that it goes well. Uh, also, I think Deneen starts, I know you're here, Deneen, uh, her last regimen, just the, the final leg of this uh, cancer defeat, and she starts that this week, so we're going to pray that goes well. Uh, Gary Schultz, are you here? He's here, and we're praising God for that. Uh, he's home and, and doing well. Uh, for the <laughs> Thank you. So uh, we're praising God for that. Any other prayer requests? Yes, uh, Julie. Okay. So Joel and Vicki Westra, Ben's father, uh, with, with Joel's cancer battle and just the weight of that. And then Lane Jervik is going in for some testing this week. There was another hand, so Pam. Thank you. And and Israel. Okay. Thank you. There's a hand over here, I thought. Patty. Yeah. Um, we have a niece living in Sioux Falls, who's in a very dire situation, broke her, a, a, a brittle diabetic and not necessarily managing that well and other complications and she broke a leg and her bones are so weak and soft that that has deteriorated. They don't know if they can keep the leg, they don't know if she can heal with her diabetes and other related in, uh, issues. So we're just praying for Olivia's recovery and in, in both physically and in every way. So thank you. Uh, yes, Amanda. Tyler Lease has a birthday on Wednesday. Tyler, does that make you 18? Tyler Lease will be 17 on Wednesday. Happy birthday, Tyler. Yes, Gwen. The high school band and choir students are leaving for Florida this evening. So prayers for safe travels and uh, protection. Yes. Paisley Carl, can, you're pretty young. I can probably still ask you, but I, I won't just to be safe. <laughs> Happy birthday, Paisley. You haven't been out of high school that long, but. Any others? 
Yes, Linda. Linda's still dealing with a, a bad fall from last win winter and appointment this week, end of the week, to determine if they need to do a re-break and reset. So. Okay. All right, let's pray together. Would you join me? Jesus, we do this because you have risen and because we know that all of the ailments and afflictions and brokenness, whether it's physical or relational or emotional or spiritual, all of it is a result of our fallenness and the sin that is upon this world. And Jesus, we can come to you now because you have risen which means the power of sin, which is death itself, has been broken. And as you stated, you have the keys of death and Hades. And you give that open door to anyone who's willing to walk through. And Jesus, you said you are the door. And if we walk through you, we walk into life. So Jesus, we pray that that life now would touch each of these situations uh, in their respective needs and places and according to your will and purpose. And Father, we pray that as we lift these concerns to you, you would anoint them, uh, that our prayers would be, be presented with faith and that you would respond in power. So Jesus, we do pray for Dwight as he anticipates this first of upcoming surgeries to repair the, the carpal tunnel in his wrists. And Lord, in the days preceding this surgery and the next, uh, and with everything he's going through, we just ask God your touch, your mercy, your power to bring comfort and healing. Give him patience and sustenance until all is corrected in his, in his body. Father, we lift up Deneen as she prepares this last chapter in her cancer treatment. We thank you for where she has come, how you've given her. Uh, even though times she doubted she could get through it, you have brought her through. And Lord, we just trust and ask that this last treatment series would put an end to any concern or fear. Uh, just give her life and recovery in every way. Thank, but thank you, Father, for uh, Gary Schultz's recovery. Thank you that whatever was going on, Lord, was, was caught early and, and dealt with. And we pray, Lord, that the healing and the strengthening would continue until uh, it's brought back to fullness. So bless him and bring strength and power into his body. Father, we continue to lift up Joel Westra and his wife, Vicki, as he goes through this cancer battle too. And Lord, you know the burden that this is. And in every way that you're, you desire to lift this from him, Lord, give him the faith to put this burden on you, for your burden is easy. Your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. So, God, we commend him into your keeping and into your healing strength. Father, we lift up Lane Jurevic as he goes in for testing this week, that you would bring answers and revelation and clarity. We pray, Father, for good and encouraging news, and we pray your hand upon him uh, to just... Give him peace and, and let the, the certainty that he's in your hands carry him through whatever uh, each day holds now. And Father, we do want to lift up uh, Linda Fossum as she goes in for this appointment to determine what to do next with her leg. And Father, this has not healed completely. And we ask that you would show a path to bring that healing and that recovery to, to fullness. So we ask your blessing upon this appointment and the results of it. Lord, we lift up our, my niece, Olivia, and Lord, just ask you for answers to her situation. It's a difficult one. I pray, God, that you would give her 
eyes of faith to look upward and to know that you hear, you see, you are there. We pray for healing. We pray, Lord, that you would protect her leg and that you would give her health in the time ahead. And Father, we pray for our students here in the community and those who will be accompanying them as they drive across, as they fly across the country uh, down to Florida. We ask your mercies over their travel, uh, over every encounter they have along the way, and while they're, we ask for protection over them while they're away from home, and that this experience would be a blessing and a joy and a memory that they will look back on for years. Bring them home safely, Lord, and use them uh, as lights wherever they are. And Father, we do uh, thank you for your blessings on us. We think of those who are celebrating certainly this day, but other milestones that are more personal and individual. We think of Paisley Carlson and Tyler Lease both on Wednesday celebrating birthdays. And Lord, just bring great blessing upon them and joy and show them uh, however you would choose on that day the, the, the magnitude of your love for them. Father, we lift up our nation, a nation that needs you, uh, much of the nation not knowing of that need, even though they're experiencing it. I pray, Father, for eyes to be opened. I pray for wisdom from heaven to come upon us. I pray for our leaders, our president, our Congress. I pray, God, that you would break through whatever is not your will and bring revelation to that which you would set before them and give them faith and obedience and courage to walk in your ways. Father, we lift up the nation of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, and ask your peace upon it. We pray for the situation in Gaza and across that land and surrounding countries that you would establish peace. And Lord, there, is so, there are so many wrong ideas of what will bring peace or what is the right answer to the situation at hand. And Lord, if they're not of you, it does not bring what is desired. And we pray, God, that you would show uh, your direction for this land and that area in the Mideast. We pray for those who are suffering in Gaza. We pray that help would be, uh, would be brought to them. We pray your protection over them. We pray, Lord, that whatever evil is present or controlling any situation, that you would bring it to the surface and let it be removed and let righteousness come. And then, Father, as we close this time in prayer, we just pray that the message of this day, even as, as it is celebrated around the world, that you are indeed alive, would not just be a holiday that gives time off or a reason to come together as family, but that it would be a life-changing and eternity-changing reality for more and more people. And Jesus, because you are alive, that is your your will, and it is possible. And bless us and use us toward that end. In the name of him who taught us to pray together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I ask if our ushers would come forward to receive our tithes and offerings at this time.
from John 1, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. coming up here I, I know now I'm going to back up one before Patrick comes up to bring our readings would you turn to your bulletin to 2nd Timothy 2 the words are printed as we respond uh, together 
Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in the gospel. We endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. If we have died with him, if we endure, if we deny him, if we are faithless, for he cannot deny himself. Amen. Patrick, could you bring us the readings? Good morning. Our Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19, found on page 605 of your Pew Bible. Your dead will live, their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy, for your dew is as the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. Our New Testament reading is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 58, found on page 984 of your Pew Bible. Now I say this, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on the immortality. But when this perishable puts on the imperishable, and this mortal puts on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of, sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be firm, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Our gospel reading is from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 12, page, found on page 902 of your pew Bible. Please stand as you are able. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in gleaming clothing. And the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, Why are you seeking the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be handed over to sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise from the dead. And they remembered his words, and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now these women were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James. Also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe the women. Nevertheless, Peter got up and ran to the tomb, and when he stooped and looked in, he saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Here ends the reading. Please remain standing for our next song, Christ Arose.
Amen. That's worthy of a clap. Thank you. And you may have a seat if you'd like. If you'd rather stand for the sermon, you're, you're welcome to do that too. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in our celebration this morning. I got a message saying unable to connect, but now it looks like it's working, so. I think, you know, probably most of us, especially if we've lived a few years, a lot of us, I think, can look back and point to a defining moment in life that maybe changed the course your life took. And that would be a lot of different things in a lot of different ways for a lot of different people. It would be kind of interesting to hear, to have a testimony Sunday and have people share about uh, what they knew God was, had done or was doing and how it changed the course of their lives. I think that would be encouraging and uplifting. In the passage that Patrick read a minute ago in Luke 24, the people involved in that passage experienced one of those moments, one of those life-changing moments. And the bookends of that moment are in the reading that we just heard, and the bookends really are verses 1 and 9. Let me share the bookends with you again. You'll remember them. Verse 1 says, On the first day of the week, early in the morning at dawn, they went to the tomb. That's the, the first bookend. The second bookend in verse 9 says, They returned from the tomb. And between those two verses, everything that mattered about their lives changed dramatically. Why? Because of verse 3. Verse 3 says, when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord. And I'm sure those those people had some incredibly anxious and emotional moments after walking into the tomb and the body was gone. Verse 4 says they were perplexed about this, and as we understand the word perplex, I'm sure that's a vast understatement. Later on in the chapter, Peter heard what the report was because he wasn't there with the women. So the Bible says, as we heard, that he ran to the tomb and found it just like he had been told. It was empty. And verse 12 says he went away to his home marveling at what had happened. And I, and I think even in, that, even in that sentence, he's marveling at it, not like, ah, oh, now I get it. I think he's marveling. He's Every emotion, every thought, every question is running through his mind at this point. What is happening? Where is he? What's going on here? They didn't have to wait very long, did they? To have whatever questions were running through their minds answered because it wasn't long before they saw their friend, their Lord, with their own eyes, the Scripture says. And you know what's so amazing about this story as we're reading it? And as we said, it's a story that dramatically changed the lives of not only these people, but many people that day, 2,000 years ago. The thing that's amazing, though, is that that very same event is doing the same thing in people's lives 2,000 years later. And I know we can find spiritual leaders, I've listened to some, who will claim that a literal resurrection isn't what's important about Christianity. Some will say that. And if that's true, church, if it doesn't really matter that Jesus is alive today, you can put me on record, for one, 
as saying then Christianity is as dead as any other world religion. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is in vain. It's dead. It means nothing. If Christ is not alive, your faith is meaningless. Because it's the living presence of Jesus that separates Christianity, true Christianity, from any other religion. There's no other religion in the world who has a founder that died and came to life again, that defeated the power of death. There is none. And it's the living presence of Jesus in your life that either has or would change everything your life is about. You know, every once in a while you hear about someone uh, changing religions, Christianity to Islam or from Judaism to Christianity or Christianity to Judaism or Hinduism, Buddhism, atheism. That's a growing trend. (laughs) And it's going on all over the world all the time because people are searching for truth and they're searching for relevance in their lives. It's something from within the way we're made. We desire truth. We desire relevance. We desire purpose. And people are searching And you know, I look at all of these so-called changes in the direction of people's lives who are doing all of these religion changes, and you know what? I don't think most of them involve any real change whatsoever, even if they change a whole different religion. Because there's no change inwardly involved in a person if a person moves from one false teaching to another. And I would contend that there probably isn't even a change that takes place in a person who moves from Christianity to Islam or whatever other religion they might choose. And why do I say that? Because if Christianity is truth, and a person truly believes the message of Christianity and experiences in their life the, the, the living Christ, I don't think there are people who, there are some, but most will not walk away from that when they have experienced the life of Christ. I I think there are a lot of people in the world today who probably wear the title Christian, who do not know Jesus, but they they, they fall, they put themselves under the umbrella. So if, if you call yourself a Christian and are not being fulfilled in your life because of it and you're not knowing the joy and the peace and the power and the difference it makes in your life and you say well I'm going to try something different and you go to another religion nothing's really changed if you if you bore the title Christian but never knew Christ it's the relationship that changes us it's the presence of him within us that changes us So the only time a person's change of focus brings real change is when the new focus is on Jesus. Because he's the only focus of anyone's search who's actually alive. And if he had not been raised from the dead, history would have gone on. Uh, People would have been born and dying. Uh, You and I would still be here likely, probably not in church, (laughs) but we'd be here somewhere doing something around. And this This is an alarming statement to make, but I believe it's true. If if he hadn't been raised from the dead, many in the world, probably, well, most, we know that, wouldn't be in any different situation than they're in right now. Because the resurrection of Jesus makes a difference that is understood only in the lives of those who know him. And that difference certainly affects our life now, but even more importantly, it affects your life after this life. You know, I I honestly don't know how people can face death when they have no idea what's going to come next. I mean, how do you have peace in that situation? Most importantly, it affects us after we die. And what does that mean? It means eternity. 
Eternity. Your, if you know Jesus, your eternity has changed. Do you know that? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, As in Adam all die, also in Christ all will be made alive. That's talking about after your body dies. In Christ all will be made alive. Ephesians 2 says that when we were dead in our sins and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, God made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places. And now listen to this. So that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In the coming ages, you, you know, right, that this life is such a tiny part of who God made you to be and what He's got planned for you. And I hope you know, and I hope you're not investing everything you're about and every hope and every ambition and desire that you have in your life into these few decades. Because if that's all you're planning on, they're going to be gone like that. God has created you to live forever. And you will, one place or another. I mean, you can't really call it life if you're not with Him, but you will go on. God has created a purpose of you for you beyond this life. And He wants you to know that now and begin living out that purpose while you're in this life. And we get so caught up in the, in the things of this world that people lose track of that, lose sight of that. Have, has that happened in your life? Have you lost track? Have you lost sight of eternity? Because the most important change Jesus made affects your eternity because it doesn't end. It's forever. Do you know that the Lord holds us as believers accountable for making this, what I'm telling you today, for making that message known. He holds us accountable to the people who don't know or for the people who don't know. And the only ones who really can even take this purpose seriously are those who know Him, who know Christ. If you don't know Him, but call yourself a Christian, you're not going to take it serious to tell others about Him. Right? If the church is going to make a significant difference in the world, if the church is going to be responsible with the purpose that God has put upon us, then the church is going to have to grow in its, and it's going to have to grow significantly in its concern for the eternal destinies of people. Do you have concern for people that you know uh, Jesus isn't important in their life? I mean, you, you have people you love who you know Jesus is not in their life. Does it matter to you what's going to happen in eternity without Him? Um, God has put that upon us. It's, we're accountable to Him for that message. Um, and I don't, it, it's baffling to me, but I, but I say that from one who knows Jesus, but it's baffling to me that people consider that making peace between people here on earth is enough. Because eternity isn't on their mind. And we live in a world who's striving for peace between people or peace between within a nation or between nations, thinking that that is the ultimate answer. Yeah, it's good if we can do that, but that's not the ultimate importance. And I will say this higher purpose that God has put on us, this eternal purpose, is more risky than an earthly purpose because it can't ignore the issue of our of, of humanity's fallenness, of humanity's sin. And who wants to talk about that with their neighbor? How many of you like to talk to your neighbor about sin? When's the last time you did that? Striving for peace between people in this life, is, like I said, it's not a bad thing to do. But sometimes the purpose of God leads to the opposite result. When you're, when you're 
being accountable with the purpose God put on you. It can lead to the opposite result. I don't know how many of, not, I mean, you're a big group here, you weren't on Wednesday night, Thursday night, or Wednesday a week ago, but both of the last couple of episodes we've watched in The Chosen here on, on our weeknights, Jesus brought this out two different times in these episodes. He said, you don't understand. He said, don't think that I came to bring peace between you. Um, he said, that's not, my purpose is not just for an earthly period. He said, sometimes it's going to be the case that because you are responsible with what I made you accountable to me about, it's going to cause people to divide. Why would that happen or how would that happen? Because people get pretty emotionally involved in things like religion or things like being personally accountable to someone beyond themselves. That can be a hot, a hot topic when you bring that up. But Jesus said sometimes it's going to point them to me and their eternity is going to change and sometimes they're going to rise up in defiance and the relationship you have with them is going to suffer. But there's a higher purpose than that. Are you willing to risk a broken relationship for the sake of someone you love for their eternity. That's kind of what's at stake here. Are you willing to risk that? If Jesus hadn't been raised, there'd be no higher purpose to your life than an earthly one. Striving and acquiring and looking out for ourselves, trying to get ourselves ahead over a period of a few decades maybe, and then entering eternity without ever having given it a thought. That's kind of the pattern of the world. And I know talking to people about spiritual things can be intimidating. But I do want to encourage you that you're not alone. If you, if you will step out in boldness and faith and in love, not holding people to judgment, that's not your job. Pointing them to one who loves them is. And if you're, will, if you're bold enough to do that, Jesus said, you're not alone in it. He said, all I'm looking for is your willingness. He said, I'll do, I'll do what changing needs to happen. When God calls you to share the message of the resurrection with those who haven't experienced it in their lives, it's not your words that will reach their heart. It's His. There is an anointing of God's Spirit upon His Word. And when you speak truth of Jesus, that's God carrying that truth to their heart. You can't change a heart, but you can, be, you can share the, the word that does. And that's all he's asking of us. If we moved further into the 24th chapter of Luke, as Jesus met up with those two travelers on the road to Emmaus, did you notice that, did you notice the conversation that they had after Jesus left them? on that walk to Emmaus. They said this, Were not our hearts burning within us while He was speaking to us on the road, while He was explaining the Scriptures to us? That wasn't just because they were in an emotional state. It's because the one who was walking with them was speaking to them words of truth that had an anointing of God's Spirit upon it that has the power and the capability to break through human resistance and touch the heart. So God says, be faithful. And I challenge us, encourage us to be faithful to the purpose that God has put on us to share the message. And He will cause the hearts to burn. One more change, one more difference that the resurrection of Jesus makes. It's in the status. You, do, how many of you realize that you are in a struggle with sin every day? Any of you realize that you have that battle going on in your life? There's a difference that comes because of the resurrection of Jesus when that resurrection has touched your life and He's living in you. Your status in that battle against sin has changed. doesn't mean you don't fight anymore. It doesn't mean it goes away for now. But your status changes. If Jesus weren't alive, there wouldn't even be a battle going on because all of, see, all of creation would have lost. Satan would have won. I mean, can you, can you imagine living this life 
at the mercy of one who has no mercy. One whose nature is completely and utterly evil. Can you imagine having no hope beyond this life? You don't have to because he's alive. And because he lives, he offers you a power that is not of yourself, but one which works in you because he's in you. And that power is his very spirit, the spirit of God. You know, if Jesus hadn't been raised, the Holy Spirit would not have come. And our lives would be missing the encouragement that God brings us. They'd be missing the comfort, the strength, the healing, the joy. We pray for all of these things just about every Sunday. The hope, the joy, the peace. God intervene in this situation. Heal this person. Give this person hope. If he hadn't been raised, none of that would be even a real thing. It'd just be pretend. And we wouldn't even have this word that we read to hold on to because the word which prophesied of his resurrection, did you hear the one verse in the Old Testament prophet that Patrick read? The earth will give up her dead. Even hundreds of years before this resurrection happened, God's word proclaimed that it was coming. If he hadn't been raised, we wouldn't even have that word because the prophecy that he would come alive would have been proven false. But the resurrection of Jesus, church, changes everything. As we close, consider this with me. All these changes that we're talking about are missing in the lives of people who don't know Jesus. They're not there. But there is hope. They're not in a situation without hope because they're still in the world. There's hope. Because Jesus lives and God's word has been proven true. And there were eyewitnesses. We read of some of them. Uh, people say, well, you can say anything you want. But there are records of people who died, who, who laid down their lives because they were not willing to say, no, I made that up. They were not willing to deny what they knew to be true. And they were killed for it. Their words are recorded in the scriptures. He's alive. And he's still changing lives today and for eternity whenever a person will turn their focus to him. This is an empty religion, church, that we're celebrating today. It's not just another religion. God's word says in Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And God says this is truth. And this is life. And this changes everything. Amen. Jesus, let this reality, this truth, so fill us that not only do we experience the change and know the change in our own lives and our own eternities, but cannot hold back from telling others about the change that is offered to everyone. Oh God, put that purpose on our hearts and give us the opportunity to be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us as we sing this last song. By the way, I put the hymnal title or number in your book, and it's not right. It's not that song. So, sorry about that. So don't go there. Don't sing that melody. We, we got our messages crossed. It was my fault. <clears throat>
again. Do you know one of the title, <coughs> titles that the church is called <coughs> in, the, in the New Testament? <coughs> you know that one of the titles for us as the church is the bride of Christ, right? You're going to hear this purpose that God has put on us in the last chapter of the Scriptures, in the 22nd chapter of Revelation. And Jesus is talking here, and He says, I am the root and the descendant of David and the bright morning star. And then He says this, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who's thirsty come. And let the one who desires Take the water of life without price. Jesus said, He who testifies to these things, and this is Jesus, says, Surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And have a blessed resurrection celebration today with your family, wherever you are. Amen.